We have been going through the book of Matthew, and we have started with the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which is Jesus' first major dissertation that's recorded in the book of Matthew. And it talks about what it's like to be a kingdom dweller. What does it require to follow Jesus? This is what it looks like. And so chapters 5 through 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. And then when we look at 8 through 9, those are chapters that are basically in 5 through 7, he was teaching what it's like to be in the kingdom. And then 8 through 9, he's living out what it's like to be a kingdom person. This is what it's like. And it was him going around healing and restoring and bringing hope and new life to people and teaching them the good news of the kingdom, which is him. And I'll share some resources about that as well in Discord later and in the show notes for this service later. But that's 8 through 9. And then 11 through 12 is the people's response to that. And we see multiple cases of some crowds are very interested. He's got some faithful followers who are following around and catching on and adopting and truly following him. And then there are a lot of people that are rejecting him. They're rejecting him as Messiah. So that's 11 through 12, or just multiple examples of him being rejected as the Messiah. And so now we are here in chapter 13, where he has changed his method of teaching and two parables. So 13 is just a compilation of many of his parables and the explanation for why they are needed. And we are last time we talked about the parable of the soils, which is basically the condition of your heart. How receptive are you to his teachings and are you truly wanting to follow him? And today kind of continues that theme because we're talking about the need for parables in the first place, which again touches on that condition of our heart. So we're going to be reading from Matthew 10, uh, or Matthew 13, starting in verse 10. We're going to go through 17. And it says, Then the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He replied, You have been given the opportunity to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but they have not. For whoever has will be given more and will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables. Although they see, they do not see. And although they hear, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And concerning them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will listen carefully, yet will never understand. You will look closely, yet will never comprehend. For the heart of this people has become dull. They are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they would not see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. But your eyes are blessed, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. So, on the surface, think about this and reflect on this. Is what lesson do you get from this scripture, if you've ever heard it before? What was the, what did you learn about it? What was it that you were taught or understood about it? And does anything stand out about it? For me... I don't remember stopping to think about this. I skimmed over it on my way to the next parable, and then only when I was studying for here at VRM MMO Church, teaching here, did I ever stop and really consider what does this actually mean. I remember the part about the hearing but not hearing, seeing but not seeing, but, um, and I kind of understood that as people being hard-hearted, but I didn't really think much more about it because I was on to the next parable. And looking at this scripture, we see that even the disciples are cute, confused about why he's suddenly changing tactics. Because they ask, why do you speak to them in parables? Why can't he just tell it straight like it is? And thinking about the context of Jesus' situation, up until now, it has been he's been pretty direct in his communication style. And that hasn't worked so far. At least not as effectively for many of the people. Most of the people. And in chapters 11 through 12, again is all stories about Israel's rejection of the Messiah. Galilean towns reject him, the religious leaders openly oppose him, and his own family doesn't understand, and John the Baptizer is questioning him, even though he's the one that first proclaimed that he's Messiah. And now here in chapter 13, Jesus suddenly changes his strategy as a result of that unbelief, and he begins using parables more often in teaching. 
And we talked about this briefly last time, but parables are not just moralistic tales. The ancient prophets used parables regularly to communicate the current state of the world of the kingdom, and also to point to future restoration and hope, that shalom. And that's why you often hear parables starting out as the kingdom is like. This isn't something new to them. And it's also about human psychology. When we see a world in a certain way, when we think we know everything we need to know, our overall human behavior is when those beliefs are challenged is not to change our mind. Our first response is to dig in deeper to existing beliefs and dismiss anything that doesn't fit. And that change only happens after too many things don't fit. And only then can we start to think maybe we're wrong. And only then can we start receiving anything new. So back to the ancient context, these people had a worldview for thousands of years, this specific view about the Messiah and God and about Messiah's coming. Generation upon generation, they've been praying for the Messiah to come and deliver them from evil. And Jesus was born during a time of great oppression by the Romans, and Israel saw Rome as that evil that they were praying to God to deliver them from. And they expected the Messiah to come as this pious military conqueror to defeat Rome. But instead they got Jesus, who was calling them to love their enemies and forgive them, and he's seemingly breaking all of their religious laws and traditions and disregarding everything. And he was completely opposite of everything they believed and hoped for. They had specific expectations for how everyone, including God and Messiah, were to conduct themselves. And then many people hated him and rejected them for this, and they wouldn't believe he was who he said he was. And so they wouldn't trust anything else he said about that topic. Think of your own experiences and think of that person in your own life that you do trust. If we have a trusting relationship, we'll trust whatever they say. But now think of a person in your own life that you don't trust. Perceptions about a person affect how well we listen to them. And if we distrust the person, we don't want to listen to anything they say. We won't believe what they say. And if it sounds reasonable, we'll think they have an ulterior motive. If we think they're crazy, we'll think whatever they say is crazy. Jesus can only do so much with people who don't trust him. If they don't trust him at all, he can't do anything to help them or heal them. They just won't trust it. So for me, it took me a long time to realize it doesn't that I don't always see when I'm being closed-minded. Subconsciously, I'm reacting to a new experience based on past experiences, and we all do this. And assume that this is happening because of how things happened in the past. So for example, my past experiences with religious subjugation of women open the door up for spousal abuse, and that affects how I react to people, how I perceive their intentions, especially men, and especially men in suits. And I have a hard time trusting their intentions, and I have a hard time feeling safe and respected around them. In one such instance, um, I had a new boss at a previous job, and he was a man wearing a really nice suit. And I immediately was intimidated by him, and I was distrustful of him. And the words that were coming out of his mouth were kind and respectful, but I couldn't get past the gender and the suit. And it took me years to get past it, and it took me years to finally realize that he was actually nice and wanted to help me grow in my career. And now finally I'm grateful for his help, and I still quote back to myself sometimes some of the advice and encouragement that he gave me. But it was these preconceived notions unfairly affected my perceptions of him, and even of God, especially since religion was used as an enabler of subjugation and abuse. So my belief was that God mandated this, therefore he's not trustworthy. He can't do much with me if I don't feel safe with him, if I don't trust him. And in spite of that, he kept meeting me where I was in my various levels of trust and maturity and pain. And he has stuck with me, patiently grabbed me by the hand and brought me through that path. And he's still bringing me through to healing and restoration now. And it took a lot of time, and over time, enough of those things didn't fit through that filter of my worldview. And I finally noticed the clog, and I finally started thinking, maybe I'm wrong about this purpose, person. Maybe I'm wrong about God. And only then could my mind be open to new possibilities. That change has to come from inside, and we have to be open to it. 
Think about a time in your own life where you have unfairly judged someone and then didn't listen to them based on your past experiences. And a common problem that is in all societies is that regardless of religion or creed or worldview, whatever that is, we all think our job is to fix people and convert them to our worldview. All humans do this, including me. And when we're speaking, we get into arguments and try to force our beliefs on others. And then we get angry when our yelling doesn't change their minds. So we yell louder. And then if they're still not on board, we cancel each other. And I'm ashamed to admit that I've done this more than once in my own life. When we're listening, we don't truly listen. We take our preconceived notions and assume that we know their intentions from our past experiences or knowledge with a completely different person or people. And we react based on those previous encounters, whether that's good or bad. And then we're so busy coming up with a response that we miss the point that they're actually saying. And instead of actually listening, we'll interrupt them to argue the one point. And oftentimes, not even the point, it's not even the point that they were making, but we're stuck on that and made that the point. We're not truly listening. And some people listening to this now may be doing exactly that. Maybe you got stuck on something I said earlier and haven't heard a word I've said since. And maybe that thing I said wasn't the point I was making and maybe I didn't mean it the way you took it. Think of some more generalized examples of this in your own lives. Even though we have perfectly good ears, we're not hearing. And this thing that we're doing is called closed mindedness. So let's look at what God says about it. I'll read through that scripture again. Starting with verse 10. Then the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He replied, You've been given the opportunity to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but they have not. For whoever has will be given more and will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables. Although they see, they do not see. And although they hear, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And concerning them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will listen carefully, yet will never understand. You will look closely, yet will never comprehend. For the heart of this person has become dull. And they are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they would not see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But your eyes are blessed because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. His response is very confusing to us as modern readers. Initially, it seems like he's being kind of cruel here, at taking what little people have and giving it to those who already have, and it seems like an unjust punishment. And whenever something seems hateful or just plain wrong in scripture, we're misunderstanding something. We need to stop and dig into that thing. And we are supposed to study everything in scripture in the light of the greatest command. The greatest command Jesus said in Matthew 22, Jesus declared, love the Lord your heart with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your intelligence. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Law and the Prophets refers to the Old Testament, the Torah. These were the laws and the prophets. So all of those weird, obscure laws that you see in the Old Testament, if we don't look at those commandments in the light of this love that he's saying that we should have for him, loving him with everything that we have and loving others as well as ourselves, loving others as ourselves, then we're missing the point. So we need to look at his response here to the disciples and their question in the light of that view of God and his love. And look very carefully at the words. It says they have closed their own eyes and they are the ones that have stopped listening. It's not that he's trying to keep this secret from some people and not others like it's some kind of exclusive club. He wants everyone to see and hear and understand. He's saying that they're being closed-minded. Otherwise, if they were open-minded, he'd be able to heal them. And the ones that rejected him missed another really important point that uh, he was saying here. Because 
They were soaked in scripture, not like we are today, but they were truly soaked in scripture. And it was often a tradition for someone to quote the beginning of a passage and then the other people, the people who were listening, would finish the rest of it from memory. We can't do that anymore, really. Not to the depth and level that they did. We can with a few verses here and there, but they could do entire scripture. And we can see examples of this all throughout his teachings. So if you continue to read this passage in Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah. Speaking about hope of coming Messiah. If you continue reading that passage. He's speaking about the hope that comes from the Messiah and pulling us out of our consequences and taking them on himself. That's what it means by accepting his healing. He couldn't heal them because their minds were close to it. The thing that they had been hoping and praying for for generations was standing right in front of them. And since they were soaked in scriptures and prophecy, they should have been able to see it. They should have been the first to notice it. But instead, they couldn't see what was right in front of them. And his followers were blessed. He's saying here they're blessed because they can see him for who he is. And these are the reasons that he's speaking in parables here. That's exactly what he's doing is he knows that they won't listen to him because they don't trust him. And he knows that change is only going to come from within themselves. And they have to realize that for themselves, but they can't until their minds are open to it, until their hearts are open to it. So the point of the parables is to get them to reflect on them, the parables, and to look, think about them, what we're supposed to do with the parables, so that the change can come from within us. And we have to have open minds to what he's saying, and we have to think on it and make these realizations for ourselves. Otherwise, he can't bring healing and restoration to our lives. Again, we have to be open to it. He meets us at our level, not just physically where we are, but at our level of trust and at our level of emotional and spiritual maturity. And he works with us and through us where we are. And he also honors our choices. He's not an abuser. He's not going to force anything on us. He lets us choose. And he lets, in the, he lets us sit in the consequences of those choices. But the good news is that if you keep reading and listening to what he's saying, he's willing to pull us out of our self-destruction and out of our pain and take it all on himself so that we don't have to be destroyed. But we have to let him. He won't force us. He gives us the choice. So how can you apply what you've learned here today to your own life? What could you do about this? So start by determining whether or not your mind is open or closed. How do you know if you're open to Jesus? Are you following his teachings? Double check the Sermon on the Mount and what it means to follow him. And where are you following him? Where are you not following him? Be honest with yourself about where you are. And if you're close-minded, if you're closed your mind to anything new about Jesus, realize and admit that you don't know everything about God or his ways. And there are possibilities in the world that you haven't even imagined and commit to have a more open mind about him. And if you've experienced or witnessed hurt by those who claim to follow him, and if that influenced your view of God and of Jesus, that was broken humans that did that. Don't blame him for something that broken humans did. Open your mind to the possibility that maybe he is actually good and trustworthy, and maybe what you've been shown or told about him isn't the real him. And if, like these crowds, your minds are blown, but you still don't fully see who he is, Admit that you don't know everything about God or his ways and stay committed to that open-mindedness. And if you're open-minded, stick with it. Keep exploring and learning. There's still much more to see and to learn. How can we all live this out together? When we're studying these parables, it's very important that we don't isolate them into solo moral tales. Not what they are. We have to open our minds to what he's saying about the larger biblical story and about the state of his kingdom. N.T. Wright says in Matthew for Everyone, Are we ready for the unexpected? Are we too in danger of deciding so firmly what God ought to be doing in our lives, our churches, and our world that we become blind and deaf to him when he tries to tell us that it's actually going to be rather different? Maybe it's not going to look like what we expect. Many of us who follow Jesus come with preconceived notions of how we're supposed to behave or respond to certain things. We have expectations as Christians of God and how we're supposed to behave. 
there's this expected quote unquote Christian behavior that we often think it's our duty and calling to immediately tell someone our doctrinal stance on an issue if they're doing something we believe is wrong. So stop whatever you're thinking about right now and listen and open your ears to what I'm saying here. Let's stop and consider the consequences of that expected behavior. Imagine if the first time you meet somebody, the first thing they did was tell you all the things you're doing wrong. And every time you see them, all they ever talked about is what you're doing wrong. Would you want to listen to them? Would you feel loved? Would you feel safe? Would you trust that person? People can only understand the message of his kingdom if they believe and trust the one who's saying it. And again, if we look at his behavior and his approach, he's meeting us where we are. Not just in physical location, but at our level of trust and emotional and spiritual maturity and he's working with us and through us where we are and he also honors our choices he's not an abuser he's not forcing anything on us and he lets us choose we need to extend that same courtesy to other people when we communicate with others maybe we could be a safe place a safe place where they can get to know Jesus and grow in his amazing love for them and then let him work in their lives as they begin to trust him more. And when we're speaking, maybe instead of immediately telling people what we believe they're doing wrong and instead of trying to force our agendas on them, we could meet people where they are both emotionally and spiritually at their current level of trust and invite them along without forcing them. And then maybe instead of canceling them when they don't agree with us or don't want to follow in long, we patiently wait for them and keep that invitation open to them the same way Jesus does. And when we're listening, maybe instead of getting hung up on something that they've said and turning off our ears to what they're actually saying, maybe we could realize that we could be placing our past assumptions on them when we hear something that we don't like. And maybe we don't immediately start thinking up our counter arguments, but instead, maybe we listen to what they're saying and ask for clarification when it's needed in case maybe we misunderstood. I'm not saying it easy. it's easy. I mess up all the time. But there's this really good book called Crucial Conversations that I'll share the link in the show notes and in the Discord later. But what's the most important thing here? Is it that people live perfect lives the way we expect them to? Or is it they come to know the awesome love and safety and rest Jesus? Let's remember what the good news of the kingdom really is. It's not about what we do or don't do. It's about what Jesus does and has done. And as soon as we make it about what we do or don't do, it's no longer good news. No longer the good news of the kingdom. So let's maybe make it a safe place for people to open up their minds to Jesus and acknowledge that we don't know everything and remain humble and open in our understanding of Scripture and of God and of Jesus. And imagine what the world would look like if we lived this out. People would be more open and honest with each other and we would be able to enable others to feel safe. They're, open their minds and listen to his message. And more people would be open to accept Jesus and his amazing love for them. And more people would be open to getting to know him more instead of being pushed away. And a lot more healing and restoration would happen. The world would be filled with a lot more hope. So I'm gonna close this in prayer and that'll be it for today. Thank you, Father, for everyone who's watching this on demand and everyone in our community. Please help us remember this and think on this and open our minds to you and to what you would have us do and to the, your way of doing things. Get past our own preconceived notions and expectations of what we think you should be doing or what we should be doing and what everyone else should be doing and Look at what you are doing and what you're teaching us to do. Help us to be open to that and humble about that and 
recognize and acknowledge that we don't know everything about your scriptures and your it is a lifetime of learning that we have to go through and we need to remain humble in that and open in that to what you're teaching help us remember this as we go throughout our weeks remind us of your amazing love for us and remind us of these things that you've said today again help my words get out of the way and speak through me move your spirit through us so that we can learn and understand what you're saying ask these things in jesus name amen